Welcome again. Today we will talk about some other characteristics of the simplex method. In particular about the use of artificial variables. These type of variables are regularly used when the model includes constraints of the type, greater than or equal to, or when equality constraints are included. Allow me to explain why the artificial variables are needed. Suppose we have the following problem. As I had commented, when we have a constraint greater than or equal to, instead of adding a slack variable, we must subtract a surplus variable. In this way, we will arrive to the following system of equations. If we create the simplex table for this system of equations, we will obtain the following. If you observe the table, you will realize that the variable S1 is basic in the first row. The reason why this variable is basic in that row, is because its coefficient in that row is 1, and in all the other rows its coefficient is 0. For the same reasons, S2 is basic in the second row. But if you observe carefully, you will find that there exists no basic variable for the third row. S3 cannot be basic for this row, since its coefficient in this row is minus 1. This problem cannot be ignored since the simplex method cannot be executed until we have a basic variable in each row. This is the reason why we need artificial variables. To have a basic variable in that row, we add an artificial variable to the third constraint. By doing this, we will have a variable with coefficient 1 in the third row, and its coefficients in the other rows will be 0. But if we only add the variable, it is possible that when we get the final solution of the problem, the variable A3 has a positive value. And if this happens, it is possible that the third constraint won't be satisfied. Therefore, the problem now consists on doing everything possible to make this variable equal to zero in the final solution. One way to force this variable to have a value of zero in the solution, is to assume that this variable causes a very big loss of profit and then the method will force the variable A3 to have a zero value when the problem is finished. To achieve this, we will say that the coefficient of A3 in the objective function is minus M, where M represents a very big value. This is the reason why this method is known as the Big M method. I will erase the table and the original problem, and I will keep the modified system of equations. Now, we will construct a new table for this problem. Observe how the variable A3, is almost a basic variable in row 3, since we only need to transform its objective function coefficient to 0. To make the coefficient 0, we follow the usual steps of the simplex method. We will multiply by minus m the A3 row, and we will add it to the objective function row. When the A3 row is multiplied by minus M, we obtain the following. Now we add the objective function row. And we obtain these expressions. This row represents the new objective function row. Our new table looks like this. Recall that M represents a very big value, for instance 1 million. Therefore, when we scan the objective function row to look for negative values, we find two values. And the smallest of them, is minus 2 M minus 4. Now, we know that the variable x2 must enter the basis, and we must find the leaving basic variable. Recall that to do this, we must divide the values of the right-hand side column, by the values of the coefficients of the entering variable. And we select the smallest of them. 
the variable that enters the basis is x2, and the leaving variable is a3. Allow me to rearrange the tables. As I was saying, the entering variable is x2. And the leaving variable is a3. The number in the intersection of both arrows is fundamental, since the construction of the new table will start considering this value. In the next table, the basic variables will be S1, S2, and X2. We begin by transferring the row of the entering variable to the new table. This row will be the same as in the previous table divided by the number indicated in the blue circle. By dividing the row by 2 we obtain the following numbers. 0 1 half 1 0 0 minus 1 half 1 half and 6. We will transfer this row to the new table, and I will highlight it in red, to indicate that it is the pivot row. Now, we will use this row to convert to 0 the other numbers in the x2 column. To convert the minus 2m minus 4 to 0, we must multiply the pivot row by 2m plus 4. This multiplication will give us the following results, 0, m plus 2, 2 m plus 4, 0, 0, minus m minus 2, m plus 2, and, 12 m plus 24. Now we add this to the objective function row, and transfer the result to the objective function row of the new table. Next we will convert to 0 the next number in this column. To convert that number to 0 we need to multiply the pivot row by minus 1. When we do this, we obtain the following. And we add the S1 row. The result of the sum will be the new S1 row. To finish this table, we only need to convert to 0 the next number. Again, we must multiply the pivot row by minus 1. And add the S2 row. And the result will be placed in the S2 row of the new table. Now that we are finished with the second table, we must look for negative numbers in the objective function row, and select the smallest of them. Now, we will divide the numbers that appear on the right hand side of the table, by the numbers that appear in the x1 column. Recall that dividing 14 by 3 halves, is equivalent to multiply 14 by 2 thirds. In the same way, to divide 12 by 1 half, is equivalent to multiply 12 by 2. And to divide 6 by 1 half, is equivalent to multiply 6 by 2. I will place these numbers at the end of the table. The smallest of these numbers corresponds to the S1 row. And we conclude that in the next iteration, X1 will enter the basis and S1 will leave the basis. Now, we must convert this number to 1. Allow me to arrange these tables again. Our new basic variables will be x1, s2 and x2. The first thing we must do, is to convert the number in the blue circle to 1. To do this, we must divide the s1 row by 3 halves, or multiply it by 2 thirds. The results of these multiplications will be placed in the x1 row, and it will be the new pivot row. Now we must convert to zero the other elements in the x1 column. We will start with the minus 3 found in the objective function row. For this, we multiply the pivot row by 3. And we add it to the objective function row. 
we place the result in the objective function row of the new table. Now we must convert to zero the next number in that column. To do this we multiply the pivot row by minus one half. And add it to the S2 row. The result will be placed in the new row of S2. To finish this table, we must convert to zero this number found in the X2 row. Again, we must multiply the pivot row by minus one half. And add it to the X2 row. This will give us the new X2 row. We have completed another iteration. But we still have negative numbers in the objective function row. Now we will divide the right hand side column by the S3 column. Recall that dividing 28 thirds by 1 third is equivalent to multiplying 28 thirds by 3. And that 22 thirds divided by 1 third is equivalent to multiply 22 thirds by 3. And given that the last number in the S3 column is negative, then the variable S3 can grow up to infinite. Hence, the leaving variable will be S2. And this is the number we need to convert to 1. The new basic variables will be X1, S3, and X2. To convert that number to 1 we must multiply the whole row by 3 and then we will obtain the pivot row. With this row we will transform to zero the remaining elements in the S3 column. To convert that number to zero, we will multiply the pivot row by one, and add it to the objective function row. The result is placed in the new objective function row. As you can see, in this table we will get to the solution of the problem, since there are no negative numbers in the objective function row. Now we must transform to zero the next number in the S3 column. To do this, we multiply the pivot row by minus one third. and add it to the X1 row. The result will be placed in the new X1 row. We only need to obtain the new X2 row. To do this, we will transform that number to zero, multiplying the pivot row by two thirds. and adding it to the X2 row. The result of the sum will be the new X2 row. And with this, we are done solving the problem. The solution is, X1 equal to 2, and X2 equal to 16, and the objective function value will reach the value of 74. I hope this session has been useful to you. I will see you soon.